Hello everyone, uh, welcome to our first edition of uh, Quantum Science Days. Uh, it's organized by uh, QWORLD. Uh, I, I, I guess some of you already heard of us uh, and during this event you can also ask us uh, about us more. So uh, we are very happy to organize this event. Uh, first of all, we would like to thank our uh, invited speakers. Uh, we were uh, really uh, grateful for our uh, five invited speakers, all are the experts in their field. Uh, we are also thanks uh, to uh, authors who submit their work. Uh, we have 26 uh, contributed talks. So the event uh, will be two days. Uh, so we will have six sessions. Each day we will have three sessions. Uh, all uh, talks presentations will be on the Zoom and uh, we will record them. Uh, most of them will be also available uh, after the event on YouTube. Uh, depends on the permission we received from the authors. Uh, in parallel, we also have a Discord server. Uh, you can also join there uh, to have more interac interaction and also asynchronized, uh, uh, let's say, communications. Uh, maybe there wouldn't be enough time to ask your questions here. Uh, in Discord, we have the program. We also have a separate channel for each talk. So you can go to specific uh, channel and ask uh, your questions there as well. Uh, QWorld events uh, always have a code of contacts. Uh, so uh, we should do our best to have a safe and harassment free environment. Uh, if uh, you see anything or if you experience, I hope not something, immediately contact the session chairs or contact me in the Discord the organizers, uh, we will we will try to carry it immediately. Uh, so let me also mention uh, about our invited speakers. Uh, we were very lucky to have uh, all of them, each of them uh, well known in their fields. Uh, James uh, Watton from IBM Zurich, uh, he will also talk very soon. Alba Cervera Lierta, uh, she is from University of Toronto. Uh, Barry Sanders from uh, University of uh, Calgary and uh, Tracy uh, Northup uh, from University of Innsbruck. And lastly, we thank to Menno Veltort uh, from QTEC and also Calvi Institute of Nanoscience. Uh, I also would like to thank our uh, program committee. Uh, this, uh, they, they really did a great job uh, attracting the invited speakers. Uh, also form the program uh, in a nice way. Uh, we have uh, Ilke Arjan from uh, Daft, uh, Aisha Kalik from uh, Pakistan. Also, she is a member of Q Pakistan. Uh, Sumet Katri, uh, he is also co-chair of the uh, program committee, and he's from uh, Louisiana State University. Probably you also know him uh, as a book with uh, Mark Wilde. Uh, Andras Pali from Hungary, he is also a member of Q Hungary. And also in the organizing committee, I would like to thank Andrei he, to take care of the, our uh, Discord server uh, and Agnieszka, uh, she, she's, she's always taking care of all our marketing uh, strategies and all the graphics. So in the first session, uh, very soon we will have <coughs> James uh, Wooten. Uh, and he will talk about uh, quantum procedural uh, generation. He is also well known uh, about his talks about uh, games and connection to uh, quantum computing and uh, quantum computers uh, also implementing on the real machines. So after that, we will have four talks. Uh, during the program, uh, you will also see uh, some of the talks from uh, Q intern. Uh, so these Q interns, uh, we had a program under QWORT last summer. Uh, it was our pilot program and uh, four of the works from that time also will be presented here. Uh, we also have uh, many authors under, uh, they are the members of QWORLD. Uh, so first we will have Stefan, he's, he's from Finland. Uh, he's also, it's, it's also joint work with me. And then uh, we will have uh, Utku. And this work is also the first research project uh, implemented under uh, QWORLD. We have a Q research department and this was the first project. Uh, you will also have a short talk about it by Zoltan uh, in the next uh, session. Then we will have uh, talks by Aurel. Uh, Aurel is also a member of uh, uh, QWorld. Uh, he's also founder of the Q Q -check, yeah? uh, Q Check. And lastly, we will have uh, Shubhayan from Poland. 
Okay, uh, so we would like to thank again uh, James Wooten uh, for accepting our talk. Uh, and now I would like to give a stage to him. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you for the invitation to talk. And now I'll share my screen. And hopefully, of course, this all goes nicely. And um, also, so hopefully you can hear me and you can see the slide and everything is all good in the world. Everything and I will fine. continue. Uh, so yeah, thank you for uh, inviting me to talk today. It's great to be here to talk about this work. Um, so as you heard, I've been looking at the intersection of quantum and games, and this is partly for education, but there's also a research aspect and that's what I'm gonna be talking about today. Uh, so let's move on. So. The, the title is about procedural generation with a quantum computer, and hopefully people here have some idea about what quantum computing is. And so the main thing that I need to explain is what procedural generation is. Well, procedural content generation can be very broadly defined as the algorithmic generation of content, and that content can be all kinds of things. It could be uh, maps. So for example, if you play a world like sorry, a game like Civilization, uh, the map that you're playing on has been procedurally generated. Or it could be the kind of worlds that you find in Minecraft as well, or the universe you find in No Man's Sky. Uh, but also in puzzle games, you can have procedural generation. So generating a new instance of the puzzle every time. Uh, you can also procedurally generate things like images or, or objects that you can place in a game, for example. So as I've intimated, uh, you use procedural generation quite a lot in games, but it's also used in CGI for making textures to make things appear more realistic. And in fact, uh, the, one of the prominent methods for procedural generation won an Oscar um, a couple, few decades ago. Uh, it's also used in art. And so it's, it's quite a big field, but let's now um, focus on the game aspect. Uh, because, uh, yeah, so I'm looking at the intersection of quantum computing and games. And to get some idea of why one might want to look at that, uh, I think it's worth spending a few minutes thinking about the history of using computers for games in general. Because I think when you say you, you're using a quantum computer for finance or chemistry or someone or something like that, people just nod sagely and think, yeah, that sounds sensible. But games maybe sounds a bit like it needs more explanation. Um, so if we look at the history of uh, using computers for games, well, in the early history of com computers, there are many examples of what you might call games, but they were typically for demonstrating what was a new technology or for educating people about this new technology or to do research about this new technology. Fun was not so much a serious consideration, profit even less so, it took sort of two decades to go from what was arguably the first game on a computer to the first commercial success. So we're thinking very much in terms of education and outreach uh, when we're beginning on this journey to using quantum computers for games. So arguably the first game was Bertie the Brain in 1950, implemented with vacuum tubes and light bulbs, and it was tic-tac-toe or noughts and crosses. Um, so a very simple game. And it was built to showcase a vacuum tube design. It was built to be exhibited at a, a trade show and help sell vacuum tubes. Um, and then there was Nimrod at the Festival of Britain in 1951. Uh, so this was a game of Nim, a game with vacuum tubes and light bulbs. And it was built to illustrate the algorithm and the programming principles involved. So it was basically built as a, as a tangible example of computing. Because I think back then, if you were a member of the public and you were learning about computing, it would have seemed very abstract and strange. The kind of problems it crunched maybe weren't very close to your everyday life. So to take this abstract thing and make it more, uh, more understandable was, was something important. And that was done through games. And this is something that we're now going through with quantum computing, which is, again, a weird, new, abstract, intangible technology. And things like Shaw's algorithm don't necessarily give people an, an intuitive grasp of what's going on. Uh, then in 1952, there was a, 
Another implementation of noughts and crosses, but this time with vacuum tubes and cathode rays. So the first graphical upgrade in the computer game industry. And that was built for research into human computer interaction. Uh, in the 1950s, IBM also worked on a checkers AI, just to show that AIs were a thing that were possible and to you know, help people understand what computers could do. Uh, oh, and this was the image that I used to sum up what this era of compute, computer games was like. Black and white, weird old technology, a, a middle-aged man sitting in a suit with a tie on. That kind of shows you that it's not the computer game industry of today. Um, but then a really significant event was 1962 when uh, MIT received a PDP-1. Uh, which is the, the computer that you can see the monitor of on screen now. And to understand how to program this and to test out the new device, to really see what it could do, and to showcase its tape capabilities, uh, they wanted to make a game. But they also had as one of their design constraints that this game should be fun to play. So uh, this was really quite a novel thing in the history of computer games because it was the first game that was novel. It wasn't just a re-implementation of an existing game and the first one made to be fun. Okay, so you've uh, signed up to a, uh, an event on quantum computing and you've received so far just a lecture about the history of computer games. Let's start talking about some quantum stuff. So uh, I, in 2017, uh, saw a demonstration of someone programmatically using a cloud computer for the first time. So in 2016, IBM Quantum put some uh, devices on the cloud that anyone could use, but you had to use it by a graphical interface, which is a great graphical interface. It's still there. Try it out if you haven't already. But most people would really want the, the more power that comes from being able to do it programmatically. And this was before Kiskip. So the first demonstration of being able to do this was quite mind blowing. Um, and it made me realize there was a lot of things I could now do with this. And one of those was I realized that I could make a game that runs on a quantum computer. And so I made a game which is a very simple implementation of battleships. And really what it turned into is a game less to be played, but more just to see how it implements. To, to, to look at the algorithm and the programming principle involved to give people an idea of what quantum computing is about. So I didn't know it at the time, but it's like the, the, the quantum version of NIM, at least in the, in the uh, purpose for which it was built. Um, and then I also made another game, which uh, was based, is based on a device. Because when we have these devices that are online, we have a certain number of qubits. And uh, on those qubits, we can, we can write quantum programs, but there are limitations as to what we can do. Um, so we can't use every possible pair, pair of qubits in a controlled operation, but there are very specific pairs of qubits for which you can do a controlled operation on a, natively on a device. Uh, and there's also the effects of noise. So I wanted to make this a little bit more obvious by making a game that was based on the coupling graph, so these pairs of qubits on which you can do a controlled knot, and um, which incorporated the noise so that it would be easier for someone who's a member of the public to be able to nicely compare and contrast different devices, not by trying to understand information about randomized benchmarking, which is maybe too technical, but by playing a puzzle game. Uh, and then in 2019, there was a game that I didn't make, so uh, that was, the, that was uh, the first time someone had made a game that ran on a quantum computer that wasn't me, as far as I know. Um, and it's basically a card game. When you play each card, that corresponds to a gate. And by uh, the players playing the game, it creates a circuit. At the end, the circuit is run to see who wins. And you can run this on simulators. But a nice thing is that you can also run it on a quantum computer and then you get the effects of noise and then you get an extra bit of tactic that you can maybe try and use the noise to mess up your opponent. So it's a game explicitly to teach players about uh, quantum programming by playing a game. Um, now, there are many more examples of what games that, that use quantum software, um, but 
there, these are the examples that run on, on quantum hardware. Uh, so if you want to make a game like uh, the Q-Pong, which you can see a screenshot here, where every time you hit the ball, it uh, adds a quantum gate, then it's too, you can't wait a few minutes for a job to be submitted to a cloud quantum computer and come back. You need instant feedback. And so it's better to use uh, simulation. Um, so again, these teach people about quantum programming, but these are using the software rather than the hardware. And uh, this is what most people tend to do when they think, when someone thinks, I want to learn about quantum computing, what's my first step going to be? A lot of people do try making a simple game and um, running it on a simulator is by far the easiest way. Um, but uh, all of these examples so far basically correspond to like the 1950s of quantum games where people are making games primarily for education. But what is interesting is to go beyond that is to look at examples of where quantum computers will actually be doing something useful for games rather than this education aspect where games are arguably doing something useful for quantum computers. Uh, so uh, what we want to do is start to, to step into the 1960s of quantum games, essentially, to find things like space war, where we're offering something useful and unique beyond just that educational aspect. And uh, that's what the procedural generation is about. This seems like the uh, most likely and concrete task within games that we can see applications for quantum computers. And so this is something that I've been doing since um, 2019. And so this is quite similar in content to an earlier slide. Um, again, uh, procedural content generation is the algorithmic generation of content. But now we're drilling down into the details, we can think, well, what kind of algorithms do you use? Well, there's many kinds of algorithms that are used in procedural generation because there's so much that you can do. There's so many different tasks you might want to perform. You might, for whether you're just making a texture or you're making a level that you want to be a specific difficulty, you want to have specific tasks along the level, uh, you want it to be completable. Um, so, you know, these things are going to require quite different algorithms. So I would say that there's kind of an easy corner of procedural generation where you're just using what are called noise functions to kind of make a lumpy, bumpy texture and you can make an island out of that. And then a hard corner where you need to satisfy certain constraints. So you need to solve constraint satisfiability problems or you want to optimize for certain things. So you need to solve optimization problems. And uh, so these, the, these require often the content you're generating to have some sort of structure so that it can easily solve those problems. But also at the same time, you're trying to generate the most different and unique thing you can, which is trying to say that it should be as unstructured as possible. So there's this constant fight of, of trying to make it as unstructured as possible, but also um, be able to solve constraint satisfiability problems and optimization problems. So this is something that we can start to think, well, maybe quantum computing can be useful for this because when we have fault tolerant quantum computers, we know that we will be able to solve certain optimization problems that we can't do now. Uh, we know that we will have a faster route to solving constraint satisfiability problems. So fault tolerant quantum computers will certainly provide tools that will be useful for procedural generation and that will be unique for procedural generation because currently you can't do those things. They are too hard for conventional computers. So you have to just find a workaround or just not do things in that way. So new and unique things will be made available when we have those tools in the future. But I prefer not to focus too much on, on that far future. Well, not too far, but you know, that it, it's, it's not tomorrow. So I prefer to focus more on what we can do in the shorter term. So what about with current quantum computation resources? So by current quantum computation resources, I mean the kind of devices that we have available to us now. And now if you think about the perspective of the general public, 
then what kind of devices can the public access? And I think, as far as I'm aware, the biggest device is still our uh, 15 or 16 qubit devices from IBM Quantum. So this is uh, certainly less than 20 qubits is what the public can, um, can use in terms of real quantum devices. But also, if you think in terms of simulation, because you just want sometimes you just want to run your quantum circuit. You don't care where it runs. Uh, so if you're happy running it on a simulator, then you have to worry about the amount of time it takes to run it on a simulator. This increases exponentially with the number of qubits, at least for a, a, a circuit which densely uh, explores the Hilbert space. And um, in that case, uh, up to sort of 20 qubits can be easily done fast enough uh, to be part of the game. So whether you're thinking real devices or emulation or simulation, I, I, prefer, to, I prefer to draw a distinction between the word simulation and the word emulation because simulation, anyway, I'm, I'm going into a rant. So let's, let's leave that for a moment. Um, yeah, up to 20 qubits we can simulate or we can um, run on real devices very easily. So that is what I would say are current quantum computing resources that are available to the public. If we can find something that is uh, useful for procedural generation, even with those resources, then it sets up procedural generation very nicely as a field in which we can do useful things now we will be able to do useful things in the far future. And so, of course, if you uh, interpolate between those two, we will continue to be useful as the technology progresses. And also, we can imagine that it will become more useful as more things become available. And at some point, we will even start to be able to do things that are unique to quantum computing. Because we have up to 20 qubits where it's easy to simulate, we can't do things that are unique. Because, well, if we're similar, we can't do things that are unique to quantum computing. What does it mean that it's unique to quantum computing? It means conventional computers can't do it. But if we are simulating it on a conventional computer, obviously a conventional computer can do it. So we're not getting unique results there. Um, but that is something that we will find on the journey as the technology progresses. And uh, in some in some cases we might in some applications this might be a sort of binary thing where we are not useful and then suddenly we are useful like perhaps Shaw's algorithm at the moment we can do 15 equals three times five at some point the technology will progress enough that we can do cryptographically uh, significant numbers so that's sort of a, a very disjoint um, change in usefulness but with procedural generation that will increase hopefully uh, continuously, and people will be able to find new things and contribute uh, over time. Um, okay, so I think I've spent enough time on that slide. Uh, well, one thing maybe I should say before we go is, for this, we have to prove that current quantum computation resources are useful for procedural generation. So let's do that. And, um, the first example is a technique we created that we call quantum blur. And this is an application targeted at a simulable number of qubits. So probably you're going to actually want to run this on a simulator rather than a real device, or you can run that on a real device. And it's very much targeting the easiest part of the easiest corner of procedural generation. It's not trying to do something sophisticated, it's just trying to get the foot in the door of doing something useful for procedural generation. So if you look at terrain generation, um, a very simple thing you can do is create a blur effect. So one way is to uh, put down a bunch of points where you want high ground to be in your island, say, and don't put down a bunch of points where you want your low ground to be, and then blur those points to create a continuous uh, landscape and that is your your terrain so if we can make a blur effect but quantum then we have our foot in the door of usefulness for procedural generation uh, so for this we need to be quantum it has to involve quantum circuits so we need to be able to encode our height maps in a quantum circuit so a height map is just uh, something where we have a, a, a given height for given coordinates. 
so the way that we do this is similar to how uh, images are sometimes encoded in quantum circuits, which is to take each position for a height map or pixel for an image and uh, assign that to a certain bit string and then encode the um, the image or the height map in a superposition of those bit strings where some quality of that bit string corresponds to the, the color or the height or whatever it is you are uh, encoding. So for this case, what we are doing is having the probability of that bit string arising basically correspond to the height it needs to be in the height map. So we need to uh, assign a bit string to each pixel or, or position. And uh, in order to get the blur effect, we have to choose very carefully how we are assigning bit strings to positions. So here, uh, hopefully you can see, I'm not sure you can see if you can see my pointer, but I'll, I'll give it a go. So hopefully you can see here, there's a pixel that I have assigned mm -hmm. the four bit string 0, 0, 0, 1. And that's in green. And its neighbors, I have assigned 0, 0, 1, 1. Uh, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, and 0, 0, 0, 0. Now, as you might notice, those are the four bit strings that differ from the one in the middle on a single bit. So uh, they are all uh, one bit different from the one in the middle. And this is, this is how we're choosing the encoding. We want the Hamming distance, which is the number of bits that are different, to correspond to the distance between pixels. So they are one position away. That means uh, we want them to differ on one bit. And then the ones in red and this one to the bottom uh, left uh, should be in red as well, but that's just a mistake. They are two bit flips away from the one in the middle. So again, the Hamming distance corresponds to the Manhattan distance. Uh, you can't completely I have a correspondence between the two, it's going to break down at some point, but as, as much as you can do it, um, so much the better. So that is the encoding that we choose. Uh, so then if we uh, make a quantum circuit out of a height map and then we modify that circuit, it means we're modifying the height map. Um, and if we modify it with a single qubit operation, what that means is that uh, any instance of a given uh, bit string in the original is going to be rotated to the superposition of that bit string and the bit string dif that differs on one bit, which hopefully corresponds to one of the neighboring pixels. So it means essentially that amplitude is bleeding out of one pixel into its neighbors, which is what you want from a blur effect. So here we can see uh, figure A where we've got uh, a very simple height map, which just has two points. This is in fact a GHZ state. These are the two points corresponding to all zeros and all ones. And then if we do single qubit rotations on every qubit, then we see that the amplitude starts to bleed out for a small angle, giving us a bit of a blur effect. If we do it more, we get more bleeding out. Uh, but if you applied a classical blur, it would just give you, after you've applied a huge amount of it, you basically just get uh, a very even, um, uh, pattern, but that's not what you find in the quantum blur because you're getting quantum interference effects. And in fact, uh, the, what you have if you if you do a rotation of pi by two is effectively the same as doing Hadamard's on all of the qubits of a GHZ state, and that is to create a, a superposition of all even parity bit strings, which gives you this checkerboard pattern. So this is just a, a simple example of um, of how this blur effect works and why the interference effects we get from quantum leads it to do things that you don't get from a normal blur. So the result is blur-like, but with quantum artifacts. And whether or not it is useful very much depends on whether you like those quantum artifacts. If they are, in your particular application, weird and horrible, then certainly do not use quantum blur. But if in your particular application they are kind of cool, quantum blur might be for you. Uh, so one thing we can do with this is exactly what we uh, said about earlier, which is terrain generation. Uh, so we can, for example, in this figure, we in figure A, you have um, some random points, and then on those, 
you can apply the quantum blur, you get a texture. And this texture in part B is fairly random looking, uh, but it's not just random heights on each pixel. You can see that the, the high ground, sort of bright pixels, are, are typically close to other bright pixels. The dark pixels are typically close to other dark pixels. So it's giving you a continuity that you might find from a, a noise function, such as Perlin noise, uh, which is what is used classically for procedural terrain generation quite often. And then you can... Um, map out a simple island. So let's say you want an island that's got a little inlet over here and an, an inlet over here. And then you can take your uh, textures and splat them all over that island to make it nicely textured. And that's what you see in part D, where the highest parts are made uh, uh, white because snow on the top of the mountains and then the lowest parts are sea and, and so on. And then if you take that and render it in a 3D game engine, then you get a nice little island to go around to explore, which is what you can see um, in the main in the picture on the left of the screen. Uh, and the underlying principles can also be used for a quantum encoding of other forms of data. Um, so if you take uh, music, then you can also work out well what does it mean for notes. What, what neighbors are notes? So notes on subsequent times obviously are neighbors, but also you can think of notes within the um, frequency space. Uh, and then you can use that to apply to encode different notes with different bit strings and, a, and then um, encode a, a piece of a, a MIDI file as a quantum circuit and manipulate it and come up with weird music. Uh, you can also uh, encode the positions of blocks in a Mario level. And this is 1-1 one, one from Super Mario Brothers, a very familiar level. And as we go on, we have more of the quantum blur effect, which leads to it becoming less and less familiar. Uh, and so we get quite a, a strange level, but you know, we can do this. And, and this was, uh, uh, so this was done with quantum blur and, in, and made by hand in Super Mario Maker. Uh, also, you can think of other effects rather than just applying single qubit rotations. Uh, for example, you could have two registers, each uh, encoding a different image. And then if you did swap gates between the qubits of one register and the corresponding qubit of the other register, it would swap the images, which is kind of boring. But what if you did the square root of a swap or the fourth root of a swap? You would get a sort of transition between the two images so if you repeat that process for many different fractions of a swap, you can do a transition between two images. And it's kind of like make, you, you, get, you can make teleportation anima uh, animations, which have the nice feature of actually being based on the same kind of physics as teleportation. Uh, so here there's a picture of Jay Gambetta um, uh, from us at IBM Quantum standing inside the shell of one of our dilution fridges very much looks like he's in Star Trek standing on a transporter pad. So I gave him a bit of a, a teleportation effect there. Um, so this is quantum blur. This is how I've used it. But of course, I'm going to use it because I made it. But is it useful to external parties? That's the real test. And uh, there are some external parties that are using it, which is very encouraging. And uh, one of them is a, a game studio in Finland called MyTale, who are using it in the development of a commercial game called uh, Clay. And this is a, a game with a sci-fi aesthetic and, and they're using the uh, quantum blur uh, inside their game because it, it kind of adds to that sci-fi uh, element. They've got these rogue AIs that are going around and, and their behavior is governed by quantum blur, which gives some sort of uh, genuine weirdness to what they're doing. Uh, so it is useful, but in this case, as in all cases, the quantum origin is an important selling point. It's not just like quantum blows in a black box spitting out um, results and people think, oh, these results are cool. You have to tell them there's quantum in this black box for them to think, oh yeah, that's cool. So it's a very early step into showing that quantum computing is useful for procedural generation, but I think it's there. So, so that's nice. Um, but we also want to move on beyond that. 
and uh, look at uh, another example, which is the generation of geopolitical maps. This is something that you often have in games like in uh, Dwarf Fortress, there is a procedurally generated world, but also this world has a history. This world has been lived in, even though it's just created before your eyes in a loading bar. Uh, once you start exploring it, um, everything has a history and it feels like it's uh, been lived in and you're actually somewhere that is a, a living world. So can we do something like that with procedural generation? Well, let's go back to qubits a moment to discuss how we might do this. Um, so, and this also for anyone new to quantum computing, maybe it's good to talk about uh, qubits at a basic level in the first talk. Uh, so quantum computers are based on qubits and qubits are basically like bits, but quantum, so they can store a zero or a one. You can get an output from them that is either a zero or a one, um, but, They've got a more interesting internal um, state. And we often like to think of qubits as being visualized by a sphere where the zero state is at the North Pole and the one state is at the South Pole. And everything else, if you ask if it's zero or one, it will give you a random answer depending on uh, whether it's closer to zero, it's more biased towards giving you zero. If it's closer to one, it's more biased towards giving you one. And the kind of manipulations that we can perform on a single qubit correspond to rotations of the state around various angle, uh, axes. Uh, so because it is uh, visualized by a unit sphere, that means that there's basically three real numbers that we can use to completely specify the state of a qubit. One is the x coordinate, one is the y coordinate, one is the z coordinate because this is the unit sphere, none of these coordinates can be greater than one or less than minus one. So that's a constraint that they'd satisfy. And also because they're bound by a sphere, then uh, x squared plus y squared plus z squared is bounded by one. So um, yeah, a single qubit can be described by a set of real numbers subject to constraints. Uh, now this is also true of multi-qubit states. So, for multi-qubit states, the number of real numbers we need, it goes up exponentially, uh, but we can still find the X, Y, and Z coordinates of the individual qubits. But uh, also, um, as I said, depending on whether you're closer to zero or one, it will give you a different probability of, of getting a zero or one when you make a measurement. So this Z coordinate is, uh, controlling probabilities of getting certain outcomes. Uh, so there's also this ZZ correlation between any pair of qubits, and that also controls the probability, and it's a probability that the two results are gonna agree. So are they gonna agree by coming out both zero or both one, or are they gonna disagree by coming out zero, one, and one, zero? Uh, that probability of agreement or disagreement is uh, given by the ZZ correlation. And so you have um, all of those ZZ correlations, but you also have similar XX correlations. You have three body correlations. You have all kinds of complicated stuff going on um, in, in a multi-qubit state. Uh, and they are also subject to various constraints, um, but also another limitation that we have in, in, in quantum computers is what I mentioned earlier that uh, well, when you do manipulations, you can do single qubit manipulations, which are these rotations, but you can also do rotations on pairs of qubits, which allow them to become correlated with each other. And there's only various pairs that you can do that on. So for this device, which is our Rochester device, um, only for, for qubit zero, uh, you can only do these two qubit operations between qubit zero and one or qubit zero and five. It's possible to do them with other ones, but it comes at a cost of increased uh, imperfections. So we have, uh, this is the device we have, multiple qubits, we can do single qubit manipulations, we can do two qubit manipulations, but only on certain pairs of qubits. And we can think of everything as being described by this big set of real numbers, which are subject to various constraints. Now, the way we design algorithms is not usually to think about these particular set of real numbers and how they evolve. Uh, but given that these are 
when we're doing simple manipulations on real hardware, these are arguably the, 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 the things that are being manipulated. It could be useful when in the near term to think about quantum computing specifically in terms of these sorts of what they, they call Pauli expectation values. So to think of a quantum computer as being a set of these numbers that we're using as variables um, to think of gates as ways to manipulate these variables. And then if we can find problems that are naturally described by similar sets of variables and are naturally um, uh, constrained by the same constraints, then a quantum computer seems like a natural place to solve those problems because the quantum computer is essentially just doing those things anyway. Um, so instead of using a quantum computer for a, an abstract task, as we usually think of in algorithms, we're using we're just letting the quantum computer be a quantum computer and trying to work out what problems that we can we can um, map to, to that. Uh, so what I've done is uh, look at a uh, basically like a game like Civilization, where you have different nations um, interacting with each other. And uh, I've got a very simple AI for each of these nations, which governs how aggressive it is and how defensive it is. Um, so uh, on how much it just wants to go and explore strange new worlds. And I've mapped those three parameters onto the three axes of the block sphere. So one axis is how aggressive it is. One axis is how defensive it is. One axis is how much it wants to explore. And then the, uh, the constraint that you must be on the surface of the sphere is basically saying that you can't be fully aggressive, fully defensive, and fully explorative all at the same time. You don't have enough resources to fully do all of those three policies at once. There has to be some compromise, and that's how the constraint to the surface of the sphere is kind of corresponding to that. Uh, also, uh, when you're thinking about a nation being defensive, then who is it defending against? Or So you have to think, look at its relationships with its neighbors to determine how it's actually going to enact that defense. And then you can use these correlations. So uh, for example, the ZX correlation is uh, between two qubits is going to describe how much, how likely it is one particular nation is going to try and attack and the other one's going to try and defend against that. And this uh, is then embedded into basically what's a simulation of, of nations interacting with each other. And the, the, and the it's a, it's a turn-based strategy. So each turn, a nation has to decide to do something and it decides based on what all of the qubits are doing. And then once you've done that, uh, a qubit, uh, these nations can gain territory, lose territory. Maybe one can even conquer a city of another. And these uh, events are all used to determine how the qubits are going to be manipulated. So if a nation loses a lot of territory, it's going to be made more defensive. So uh, the, rotate, the gate is going to be applied, which rotates it more to its defensive state. And then you uh, do the tomography to get all of these variables again, decide what happens in the next turn, then we feed back into the quantum state and so on and so forth. It's an iterative quantum algorithm using the quantum part to do the decision-making and the classical part to uh, enact those decisions and see what the consequences are. Okay, um, so the, the way that this is done is using a thing called Quantum Graph, which I've built on top of Qiskit, which is our open source software for quantum computing. And it's uh, basically made very much because in this, you need to be able to get these X, Y, and Z coordinates of the block sphere. You need to be able to manipulate them by saying, not you don't want to say, I want to do a certain rotation around the X axis. You want to say, I want to do whatever gate is needed to rotate this qubit as close as it can be to its uh, maximally defensive state. And so you just say you want that, and it works it out for you. And this is all on GitHub, so you can try it out if you want yourself. I'm doing a game jam this week where I'm using it as well myself. Um, so yeah, with all this, we have a procedure for generating maps with a history behind them, because at the end you get a geopolitical map and you can also tell when each city was created, why it was created, how it has changed hands between different nations. So you, you get an actually properly lived in map 
because the simulation of nations was mapped to the simulation of qubits interacting, and that's something you can do on a quantum computer. Um, but in order to really claim that this is an AI, there has to be some element of I, so it has to behave in some way intelligently. Um, I'm not saying it's the most intelligent AI there is, and it's much more like the very rudimentary checkers AI back in the 1950s, uh, but we need to show that it's doing something good rather than just say, oh, isn't this cool? Uh, so um, some runs were done where half of the nations were governed in the way that I've been describing so that we see what the consequences of their actions are. And this is then turned into additional gates which manipulate their state. And then the other half were implemented such that they were just placed in a state where they would choose things randomly. And that was never changed. So you've got the, the ones that learn from their actions, learn from what's going on, and the ones that are just random. And we would hope that the ones that learn then do things better than the ones that are random. And the way to test this is, well, which nations are bigger at the end? Because big is good, or at least with a very simple um, understanding of geopolitics. Uh, and this is a very simple simulation of geopolitics, so that should be sufficient here. Um, so the first try was done with emu emulated runs. So we have seven nations, nine nations, 11 nations, all run on simulators. And we find that the ones that learn from their mistakes are better than the random ones. They, they have bigger nations. So that's good. Uh, so yeah, as years go by, or as turns go by, you find that they are increasingly uh, better off. Uh, but a big test is to run it on real hardware, to run it on a real quantum computer, to see what the effects of noise are, to see how it runs when you actually do it with real hardware. Um, so we can use uh, more nations here than, than can be simulated. Uh, so we've got the, 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 we ran it on the Cambridge device, which has 28 qubits, and so we have 28 nations. And the Rochester device, which has 53 nations. And uh, we find again that the ones that learn from their mistakes do better than the random ones. So there is an element of intelligence to this artificial intelligence, even if it is very rudimentary. And so despite the noise uh, affecting the quantitative res results that we get out, we won't get exactly the right numbers out. Qualitatively, it's still uh, evolving these uh, variables in a, in, in a way that's useful. It, the constraints that, that are applied to them make sense within the game world. And so it is working in a way that is useful to us. Okay, so uh, with that, I can now come to my uh, conclusion slide. And we find that, oh, I was trying to stop the GIF because this GIF is really terrible for my CPU. Uh, so even now we can make quantum software that is useful for procedural generation. And we saw that in the context of quantum blur, which actually, even though it's quantum software, because we're making quantum circuits, is actually better to run on a simulator than with a real device. Uh, and we also saw that in, in this quantum graph based uh, game AI, uh, which ran on real devices. Although arguably you can probably run it quite well on a suitably configured simulator as well. Uh, and so uh, both of these uh, led to papers and these papers were presented at conferences uh, pertinent to procedural generation last year. So you can look up the proceedings um, to see that they were peer reviewed and all of that nonsense. But for the more accessible archive link, I've put the archive references on here so you can look them up uh, easily. Uh, and these are also uh, packaged into a simple game engine that we've made for anyone who is looking to make a simple game in, a, uh, in order to learn about quantum computing. Um, so if you want to know about that, I did a, I and some colleagues did a Twitch stream a few weeks ago where we explain all of these resources. So you can head to twitch.tv slash quantum gym. And there's also some things on GitHub. You can go to github.com slash kidskit community as in the previous links, there's all kinds of stuff there. Uh, so yeah, these are the first steps into showing that quantum computing is useful for procedural generation even now. And now it's time to find even more sophisticated techniques I will be trying to do that, but 
part of why we have come up with this particular research field is not just so we as IBM can, can win quantum and be the best there ever was. Uh, it's also because it's a, a nice, accessible, easy field for uh, people who are learning about quantum to start working in. So maybe you will beat us to find the, the first unique application of quantum computing for procedural generation. And if so, I look forward to seeing that. So uh, thank you for your attention. And now I will answer any questions that you may have. Yeah, th thank you very much. It, it, it was a great, great presentation. So uh, I, I received three uh, questions. First is from uh, Andras Palli. Uh, he say, okay, it's maybe slightly off topic, sorry, but uh, what are your definitions of quantum simulation and quantum emulation? Oh yeah, so, um... Well, simulation is often used uh, in order to, uh, as like a, in quantum chemistry or, 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 or high energy physics, we might want to simulate a quantum system uh, using a quantum simulator. Um, so simulation uh, is, is used for that uh, use case where we're using a quantum computer to simulate another quantum system. But we also often use the same word simulate to mean a, um, a classical computer. So a conventional digital computer simulating a quantum computer. So these are very different things. And I think that some people have a lot of problems um, trying to work out what we, what we mean when we say this. Often people who are in the field of quantum computing, it's obvious what someone, which one someone's talking about, but people entering the field, it's less obvious. So I think emulate is a better one to use for um, using conventional digital computers to, uh, to, to, to emulate what a quantum computer is doing. And if, if we could all as a community change our terminology to be easier for people to understand, that would be great. But uh, that's probably not gonna happen anytime soon. Okay, thank you. So Vishal Kumar asks, can we play these games on classical computers? Uh, one of the participants, Janash Aspot, already suggested a website, uh, decodoku.com. Uh, would you mm -hmm. like to add something more? Or I don't know, you know this site or not? Yeah, so there's quite, well, often it's the kind of games that people have made that run on simulators that can be easily um, run on um, in places that people can play. So, uh, so when people make game jams that use quantum computers, you quite often find them on itch.io as browser games. And Dikadoku is one that I made back in 2016 as a game that uh, um, can help people solve problems that we have in uh, quantum error correction. So it's often these, these games that are based on the ideas of quantum that are easy to play. Ones that run on actual quantum computers are usually kind of hard to play. There's not really a link I can give you to play a game on an actual quantum computer because you've got all of these issues with uh, uh, API keys and whatnot. Uh, one thing I have uh, created is a Twitter bot which can run games on a quantum computer and then people can interact with it by by uh, messages on Twitter, but it's not always running. So I've got a version of NIM that I sometimes run on there. And uh, yeah, if people are interested, I could fire that up sometime during this event and people can go and lose a game of NIM against a quantum computer. Thank you. Uh, one, one short question, it was about uh, quantum teleportation. Uh, which tutorial you would suggest? Uh, well, uh, we at IBM Quantum have a textbook so you can find it at kidskit.org slash textbook i think if that is not the url it really should be um and that is is i would say one of the best places to learn about most things in quantum computing but i'm kind of biased because i did write a lot of it uh, there is a section on teleportation there i think it's pretty good so i would suggest that okay okay thank you uh, I did it also ask if one uh, wanted to get into quantum research, what education path would you recommend with your experience? Yeah, so the traditional route uh, is that uh, people would uh, do a PhD in either um, 
One, so quantum information is an interdisciplinary field between physics, uh, computer science, and uh, maths. And so the traditional route with always people getting a PhD in one of those fields in a group that is interested in quantum computing, doing that PhD, moving on to postdocs and so on. Uh, now we're in a, an era where there's a lot more industry involvement. So uh, there are people who are coming into quantum computing who are not going the PhD route. Um, so for that, it's often good to be uh, active on uh, open source projects based around quantum computing, such as Qiskit. So if you're there working on Qiskit, learning on the job, so to speak, then um, that puts you in a good position to getting one of these sort of uh, industry-based jobs. Uh, but uh, yeah, I would, I would, uh, I, I, I don't, wouldn't, I wouldn't tell someone to go for one or the other. Um, because it depends on your own personal circumstances and motivations. Uh, the, uh, but the traditional route is probably the, uh, the well, it's still the traditional route, um, but uh, yeah, we're, we're getting a lot more emphasis on the, the newer software development based route as well. Okay, uh, maybe one last question. Uh, by the way, James, you will be in the Discord. I saw you already. Yeah, maybe some people can write at that channel and you can answer also from there. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I'm uh, Quantum okay. Jim on the GitHub. Uh, you also have a separate uh, channel for your talk. Uh, people can also go there and ask questions there. Uh, maybe one uh, simple question. Uh, maybe it's also technical. What one uh, can call as a CPU clock speed regarding quantum processing? Uh, well, it's hard to... So that immediately want, makes you want to compare to um, conventional computing, but quantum algorithms do things in such a different way that it's not really a fair comparison to say what is the effective clock speed of a, of a quantum computer, uh, because, well, basically it's quite slow in comparison. If you were to do a like-for-like -like comparison, its advantage comes in doing things a completely different way. And the actual... But uh, in terms of how fast you can apply gates, that depends a lot on the architecture that you're looking at. So there's orders of magnitude difference between the trapped ions that some people are looking at and the superconducting qubits that we're looking at. Um, and uh, I think we're at the kind of megahertz level uh, in that regard. Uh, but yeah, don't, don't compare that to the, the faster processor that you have in your phone. Okay, uh, thank you very much.